starts right now. We begin with some late breaking news from the northeast side. More than a thousand inner CPS Energy customers are now without power. Take a look at the map here. You can see that trouble area is near Loop 1604 and Bulverde. As CPS Energy officials say crews are working to get power restored. They are not the only crews, though, that have been called to deal with the problem out here. Patty Santos joins us live to explain exactly what caused all this. Patty. Yeah, I've just been uh, talking to the incident commander here with San Antonio Fire Department. They tell me they believe that the fire started with this power pole. When that fire sparked, then uh, spread into a straight line right behind me into this greenway, into the field that you see behind me, about 20 acres that were impacted. There is a community right on the other side. It's called uh, a greenway forest. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the crews are coming back. Uh, putting out some hot spots, making sure that everything is doused. There, as, as you already know, it is very dry right now, and uh, there is a slight uh, breeze up in this area. We're kind of in a little hill area here. But again, uh, these customers that are impacted, fire crews uh, putting out the, the fire here, and CPS energy crews have been working, and they tell us they should have the power back on around 6.30. We'll send it back to you. A death penalty case coming to an end today after an unexpected plea deal. Jose Baldomero Flores was facing two capital murder charges in two separate murders that had actually been cold cases. Erica Hernandez in the courtroom today as family members of both of the victims faced Flores for the first time. No parents should ever have to plan their child's funeral. Two families still grieving after years of pain and suffering and not knowing who killed their daughters. In 2005, Heather Wilms was found murdered in her apartment, and in 2011, Esmeralda Herrera was also found murdered in her apartment. Both had been friends with Jose Baldomero Flores, who in 2016 was arrested and charged with their deaths. To the reduced offense of murder, how do you plead guilty, not guilty, or no contest? Guilty. After his plea, Heather's mother and stepmother facing Flores. Every fiber of my being wants you to suffer and live in fear, just as my Heather did, just as Esmeralda did. So today, I take back my life. I forgive you. Joe Flores stole so much from us. We have lived with overwhelming fear. He will live out his life in prison. And we will carry Heather in our hearts forever. Meanwhile, the Herrera family had a letter read in court by a victim advocate wishing pain and suffering for Flores. In the end, both families having some sort of closure as Flores heads to prison. Despite those charges being dropped to first degree murder charges, Flores was still given two life sentences. There will be no opportunity for a chance at parole. At the Cadena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. And now to the latest out of Uvalde, where CNN is reporting that principal of Robb Elementary, she has been put on paid administrative leave. An attorney for Mandy Gutierrez confirmed that with CNN today. We have a crew of our own right now in Uvalde. We have not been able to confirm that yet with Uvalde CISD administration. We are working to get that confirmed, but so far the district says they're not confirming that at this point. This development is the latest in the fallout of the wake of the deadly shooting of 19 students and two teachers back on May 24th. The information from CNN coming out just before a planned meeting of the Uvalde CISD school board this evening. And speaking of that, they've been emotional, sometimes tense as a community looks for accountability. The Uvalde school board will meet. It's about to start in about 30 minutes. We know they'll be discussing a new elementary school, considering approving a resolution heading to the governor's desk. Our Lee Waldman is in Uvalde waiting for that meeting to start. Lee, a similar resolution actually passed by county commissioners not that long ago. Yeah, Steve, that county commissioners passed a similar resolution two weeks ago on July 11th. The district and commissioners are encouraging the governor to call for a special session. The goal is to change gun laws. They're asking for the minimum age to purchase a semi-automatic assault style rifle to be raised from 18 to 21. In the background of the school district's resolution, they talked about what happened at Robb Elementary, stating, quote, 19 children and two adults were murdered by an 18-year-old 
assailant with an assault rifle, unquote. We know a similar resolution will be brought up at tomorrow's Uvalde City Council meeting. Jasmine Casares, Jackie's older sister turned advocate, has been vocal about the need for meaningful changes. I never imagined that this is what it had to take for everyone to finally realize, like, stuff's messed up. Now, as far as the new elementary school, the school board tonight will discuss approving an agreement between the district and the Uvalde CISD Moving Forward Foundation for design and a new location for that new school. Now, District Police Chief Pete Arredondo's employment status is nowhere to be found on this agenda tonight, but we do know 15 minutes have been set aside at the beginning of this meeting for public comment. I'll bring you the full wrap up of what happens tonight on the Night Beat. Live in Uvalde. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. A Bear County deputy arrested and facing a charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for allegedly beating a woman inside of a West Bear County home and then threatening her with a handgun. 43-year-old Noe Avila was arrested today. We're told that the woman was able to get away, ran to a next-door neighbor's house, and called 911. By the time the responding deputies got there, Avila was gone. It was Atascosa County deputies who caught up with him a little after midnight. Avila is a 19-year veteran of the Bear County Sheriff's Office, and according to KSAT Investigates, he is the ninth Bear County deputy arrested this year and the second arrested for family violence in the last six days. One business owner asking for the public's help after his north side collectible shop was broken into early this morning. Charlie D. Pietro received a call about his shop's alarm going off about 4 a.m. What he saw next were thieves disguised in all black, taking thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. Police responded to the Monday at Sports Cards Plus located in the 2200 block of Lock Hill Selma to find glass all over the floor. DiPietro saw on his surveillance cameras the burglars grabbing things and putting them in trash bags. And the items they took were not cheap. Stuff that if they wanted to sell it, uh, they're not going to sell it at the flea market. It's going to be sold on the Internet. He says he's willing to offer a reward through Crime Stoppers to whoever can help catch up to these suspects. New at six, they escaped the Taliban and came halfway around the world to make their home here in San Antonio. Then on Saturday, a fire at the Sierra Ranch Apartments in the heart of San Antonio's refugee community near the medical center. The cause of that fire is so far unknown, but now we do know 15 families are living elsewhere in that complex this evening or staying with other Afghan refugees nearby. Jesse Degollado tells us what some are doing to help them start over yet again. Less than a year after it began, Khan Jalal Zai's American dream in San Antonio quite literally went up in smoke. He said, thanks God, nobody injured, no, but uh, a lot of damage like uh, blanket, furniture, clothes, everything. Moments before, he and his wife had a friend over for dinner when fire burst through the floor from the apartment below. Even from out here, you can tell where the flames shot through the roof, leaving a gaping hole in one of the buildings. His was among the 15 families evacuated by San Antonio firefighters Saturday night. 18 units were damaged, six by the flames, and the rest had smoke and water damage. We're just standing by. Families know they can contact us, and we will do what we can. Since he can't speak English, in Dalal Zai's case, it would include a phone call on his behalf. I'll do that. I'll do that for him. I'll call his employer and tell them why he didn't come to work. Margaret Constantino says the Center for Refugee Services, the American Red Cross, and others are ready and willing to help those like Jalal Zai, who'd worked alongside U.S. Army forces in Afghanistan. This is what neighbors do, and we're just glad that they are thinking about coming here. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic on this Monday. We're going to go to 410 and 35, which is usually a traffic trouble spot, and very much so at this hour. This looks like the northbound lanes of 35, where it comes together at 410, and you can see traffic very busy in both directions, but especially right here where they're trying to ease in merge on this Monday, a Monday <laughs> merge. Pro football returning to San Antonio, but along with it, some doubt about whether this will be another failed football franchise in the Alamo City. The stats for pro football in San Antonio, not great. And as our RJ Marquez found out, it's not always about the fan support. The fans have been there. 
He tells us what this new league could mean for the city and what are some of the biggest factors in its survival. From the gunslingers to the commanders, San Antonio has been home to many pro football teams that have not lasted very long. Go San Antonio! But the XFL, the league co-owned by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, is giving the Alamo City another shot. It'll enhance the quality of life. So if you're a sports fan or, you know, even more so if you're a football fan. Dr. Steve Niven is an economics professor at St. Mary's. He expects the league to draw well in San Antonio, but says it's not just about fan support. The bigger question of the two, again, is whether or not the league itself is, is sustainable. This new XFL team will play their home games right here at the Alamo Dome next spring. And Professor Nevin says that's a good thing for area businesses. And he also says that it's important because it keeps money right here in San Antonio that could have otherwise gone somewhere else. They would have traveled outside of the, the city to attend any, you know, another football game or any other event and use that money then and now it counts towards the impact. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says a key difference from previous leagues is the national exposure the city will get. If they have a good television contract, uh, that will give the city of San Antonio a lot of visibility across the nation, as we've got with the Spurs. But like Professor Niven, Judge Wolf says it all comes down to the league's financial support and viability. And they've got to be sure that this league is funded. We don't want to get off in another losing endeavor and the losing endeavors is not because we didn't draw the crowds, but because the league was screwed up. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Cautiously optimistic? About football? Should we say that? I, I'm, I'm more optimistic <laughs> about football than I am rain over the next week, that's for sure. Oh, we're trying to be optimistic about this summer weather, but sheesh, Sarah. Yeah, I can spin anything in a, to be positive. <laughs> Hey, here's yeah. some positive. You, you got your work cut out for you. Okay, we're not going to be at record highs this week, but but really, honestly, it's pretty bad out there. We need some rain. The aquifer is down four tenths of foot over the past 24 hours. Even the pollen count is up from yesterday. Molds are moderate. A lot of people have been asking me, Sarah, how does this summer compare to 2011 when we had another drought? I'll tell you that information coming up, and of course, your work week forecast. It's still my favorite cave and it's still impressive to me even after all these trips. It's still an incredibly impressive cave. And today we are taking you there as well down into Honey Creek Cave and the Trinity and Edwards aquifers. Not only is this beautifully unique, it is vital. But development in Comal County, it's happening fast. Conservation efforts are trying to keep pace or in some cases catch up. In today's case that explains, we show you what's at stake here and what's being done to protect this. That's coming up at 6:30. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. For what it's worth, I know they're not superhuman. I just wish that there was a more timely and just more effort-driven response. A San Antonio man shares his frustration after thousands of dollars in his valuables were stolen from his locked storage unit. What he says the thieves got away with. Also empty shelves at the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. Not what you want to see, how a drop in donations is affecting local hospitals. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. We'll see you then. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, it is a hard earned benefit for those who served our country. The VA loan program has helped veterans become homeowners for almost 80 years, including women veterans of color. Courtney Friedman spoke to a new homeowner who said the program helped her Gold Star family get a home even in this difficult housing market. Marisol Deck met the love of her life in the Air Force. She served for almost four years and Master Sergeant Christopher Robert Deck served for 22 years until he passed away just a year ago. That's all we would talk about is, oh, we're going to go to Texas, we're going to retire, we're going to finally own a house. Two months ago, she made that dream come true for her four kids in honor of their dad. And she did it all through the VA loan program. The VA loan has grown incredibly over the last 15 years. This was historically only about 2% of the mortgage market today. It's about 12%. Chris Burke is the VP of Mortgage Insight for Veterans United Home Loans and says despite the incentives, the market over the past couple of years has been tough on veterans. We've seen so many home sellers who won't even accept 
a VA offer. They're looking for cash offers. I was very lucky. These VA loans offer much lower interest rates as well as no down payments, but because of the competition in this current market, she actually did put a down payment on this house. But Burke says recent rate hikes have actually helped the veterans utilizing these loans. Especially over the last few months have led to a little bit of a decrease in demand. Helpful for a specific growing veteran homeowner population, women of color. Veterans United reports between 2018 and 2021, VA home loan usage increased 23% for black veterans. Veterans, almost 35% for female veterans, and Hispanic veteran homeownership was over 18 percentage points higher than civilian counterparts. Like a proud Latina, you know, I did it on my own, served my country. Leveling the playing field for the most deserving Americans. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's turn to the weather out there. We are trying to find a glimmer of hope in any forecast. Yes. Some change, something. some sort of silver lining in all of this. So am I, guys, but it's <laughs> difficult. I'm not going to lie. It is difficult. The biggest silver lining is that we won't be hitting records, but what we would really need is some rain. Unfortunately, the drought continues to be very bad across not only South Central Texas, but also across the state of Texas itself. I'm showing you right now the drought condition currently. I want to compare this to the drought of uh, in July of 2011 because as you know, that was an extensive drought too. Here's a look at right now, and then here's a look at 2011. So the drought was worse across the state of Texas back this time in 2011. I'll show you a closer view here around South Central Texas and San Antonio. It's bad out there right now, but this is how bad it was back in 2011. Now the drought might have been worse in 2011, but the heat is actually worse for us this year. So far, we've had 46 100 degree days this year year and we haven't even hit August yet. This time back in 2011, we had only had 19 100 degree days and that should say up to July 25th there for a total in the year of 57. We're closing in on that total of 100 degree days already. And as I said, we've got August and even probably some of September to get through as well. Here's a look at the forecast for the next several days. High temperatures near or above 100. Now notice that those records they're going to be difficult for us to get to records of 103 to 106. We're probably not going to hit those records. So that's the only silver lining I can find here in the forecast for us. Otherwise, it is dry. We've got some monsoonal rains across West Texas and across parts of the Four Corners region, but notice that there's a big hole in the rain right over Texas. That's where that heat high is. Here's the thing. Uh, the jet stream is to the north of us, so lots of rainfall for areas north of Texas and even across parts of uh, the northeast and New England, but that heat high is holding steady. Here's a look at highs today. You can you can guess where the heat high was just by looking at the colors on your map all across Texas and the Central Plains 103 for the high in Oklahoma City. It's still 99 degrees outside right now. We do have a wind gusting up to about 25 miles per hour from the east southeast, so it's breezy. It still feels like 100. Humidity is, is slightly higher, and that's why it feels a little hotter. Tonight, sunset at 831. It's going to feel warm, though, and breezy with gusts up to 30 miles per hour. Temperatures will be falling into the low 80s. As I said, those winds are gusting right now from the uh, southeast at about 25 miles per hour. That's going to pull back in even more humidity, and that's why tomorrow you're going to wake up and it's going to be humid and warm outside for that morning commute. Wind gusts of 25 miles per hour right now in San Antonio. For your Tuesday forecast, waking up at uh, 78 degrees. Sunrise uh, will be 651. It'll be 91 at noon, 101 for the high temperature tomorrow. Sunsets at 830 tomorrow. And and we'll still be in the 80s, near 90 degrees by 10 p.m. Elsewhere, here's a look at your neighborhood highs tomorrow. Pleasanton, you'll be at 103, 102 in Uvalde, 102 in Del Rio, 98 in Kerrville, 95 in Rock Springs, 101 in Seguin. Nixon Smiley, you're going to be at 101 degrees. 102 in Poteet. All right, it is going to still be pretty humid tomorrow, so expect a heat index value anywhere up to 104 on top of that heat. Uh, it's going to feel even hotter because of the humidity. Again, we're on repeat, trying to find the silver lining. 10% chance for a stray coastal shower Wednesday through Friday. That's the best we can do for rain. You sound positive reading yeah. all yeah. those 100 right. degree temperatures. Yes. Uh, not so positive though, guys. The look at the lake levels. I'll have that in the next half hour. Oof. Okay. We're also, we're also gonna, you know, you're gonna get out your scuba gear and go 
I am. Cave diving. Part We've of got that, that a little bit later. Yeah, that's coming right. too. But right now, let's go to a much cooler Southern California where our friend Greg Simmons joins us now. Greg, a lot of questions for the Cowboys last year. Not the case this year necessarily. No, because both Dak and Ezekiel Elliott are coming into this training camp fully healthy. When we come back, what does that mean to this team that went 12-5 and last season only to be ousted in the first round of the playoffs? Plus, a Cowboy cleared just before camp kicks off. Coming up. Camping with KZAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome live to the Dallas Cowboys 2022 training camp headquarters here in Oxnard, California. That will be our home for the next two weeks. Now, the team buses departed to start today, headed for the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, where they boarded their charter flight that took them from DFW to LAX, and then a one-hour drive from Los Angeles to Oxnard, where we are right now. The players, coaching staff, and staff arriving to Marriott River Center about an hour ago will be camping in California until August the 10th. Over the course of the next two weeks, a lot will be discovered about how this team will not only start the season, but give you a glimpse of what they can build on after their 12-5 and finish last season and get past the first round of the playoffs. It all starts Wednesday with the very first practice. Training camp's huge, uh, you know, for everyone, especially, you know, for myself. Uh, it's really t a time to kind of get your, your legs back underneath you, your timing, um, really start to gel as an offensive line into the football team. Um, you know, we still are finding our, our identity as a team. Obviously, every year is different. So, um, you know, this, this next month out here is going to be big for us. Now, one of the two main focuses when it comes to the hell will be keeping a solid eye out for what will be that of star quarterback Dak Prescott and running back Ezekiel Elliott. Prescott will start training camp this year without a single restriction after suffering the worst injury of his professional football career in 2020 after suffering a compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle that knocked him out for the rest of the season. Then after a miraculous recovery, he played in 16 games, throwing for almost 4,500 yards, 37 touchdowns. Now he comes into camp with a no-holds-barred attitude so much further along than I was last year at this time. I mean, just being able to get the team reps, as you said, being able to move more, um, take care of my whole body and just focus on everything and not just my leg. Uh, it's a huge difference. Cowboys star running back Ezekiel Elliott comes into camp after suffering a partially torn posterior cruciate ligament in his right knee that hounded him over the last three months of the season. Still, he's able to gain over 1,000 yards, the fourth time he's been able to do that in his NFL career. Now video and social media shows he is fully healed and looking like his old self. The Dallas Cowboys reporting that cornerback Kelvin Joseph has been cleared in a murder investigation and is part of the players group that reported today for training camp. That means he will be allowed to participate in the start of camp, even though, according to Yahoo Sports, the NFL is monitoring cooperation with the Dallas Police Department as part of their investigation into a drive-by shooting last March. Cameron Ray was shot to death in East Dallas, but before that, Joseph appeared in video that showed he was part of a group that was engaged in an altercation with a group that also included Ray. After shots were fired from an SUV that killed Ray, Joseph was identified as a person of interest in the investigation. His own lawyer admitted he was in the vehicle but was not the shooter and was fully cooperating with police. Say hello to our newest professional football team, San Antonio of the XFL, which will make their debut along with the rebirth of the league in February 2023. The XFL was purchased by Dwayne The Rock Johnson from former WWE chairman Vince McMahon and the addition of new teams that announced last night in Arlington, the first professional football team for San Antonio since the San Antonio Commanders, who went 5-3 in 2019 before the Alliance of American Football folded. And coming up tonight on the night beat, when did the mayor know this is going to be a possibility? He will tell us. Live from Southern California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. All right, thank you, Greg. We'll see you at 10. All right, still to come here next, we're going to dive deep, quite literally, into one of the most beautiful and longest caves in Texas. It's right north of San Antonio, but there are some big questions about how to keep it like this, how to preserve it. KSAT Explains is up next. Comal 
County sits in the crosshairs of an intensifying battle between conservation of precious resources and a growing population looking to call the Texas Hill Country home. Its location puts it on a geographical battlefield. Yeah, it's also home to the longest cave in the state and a cave that's a great example of what's at stake. Recently, Justin Horn and Sarah Spivey were granted special access to that very cave, which showcases the Trinity Aquifer and lies on private property. And in today's case that explains Sarah and Justin take us inside Honey Creek Cave for a swim, but also to highlight how it now coexists with a fast growing Comal County. A quick ride over rugged terrain and private property it gets us to what looks like the Garden of Eden. A waterfall marks the entrance or exit, depending on how you view it, of the longest in one of the most beautiful caves in Texas, Honey Creek Cave. It's a major discharge point for the Trinity Aquifer. The cave itself is a significant water source that feeds Honey Creek, which then feeds the Guadalupe River. Exploration of this state treasure requires a wetsuit, not just because it's filled with water from the Trinity Aquifer, but because the water is a chilly 68 degrees. Today, we'll be swimming. It's still my favorite cave, and it's still impressive to me. Even after all these trips, it's still an incredibly impressive cave. Kurt Menking has been surveying Honey Creek Cave since 1980. The cave lies along Honey Creek, just south of the Guadalupe River. I don't remember exactly how many times I've been in here, but it's well over 200. He, along with hydrogeologist Gary Schindel, experienced caver John Young, and Helen Ballou, a conservation consultant for the Kamau County Conservation Alliance, will be leading Sarah Spivey, photojournalist Adam Higgins, and myself into this aquatic adventure. We're going to keep an eye on you. We're not going to let you do anything too dumb. So with that in mind, in we go through a small entry point, and immediately it's apparent. Despite having caved many times, this is unlike anything I've experienced before. This cave is uh, formed along a series of joints and fractures, and so the, the cave is uh, linearly extends about five miles. Uh, it's also relatively unique in the sense that it only has one natural entrance. It's 15, 20 feet wide, over your head deep for most all of it, and there's formations that come down from the ceiling into the water, so you have to weave your way through them in a lot of places. There are a number of species in the cave, some aquatic, uh, some terrestrial. There are bats in the cave. And as we found out, the ever-famous blind salamander also calls this cave home. The water crystal clear, and halfway through, the cave requires us to go underwater. When you get up here, push your floaty stuff through, and then I'll give you my, my hand and I'll pull you through. It's not a place for the claustrophobic, but if you can brave some tight spaces, chamber after chamber reveals even more beauty. So Justin and I are 1,500 feet into Honey Creek Cave, about 80 feet below the surface. And we've made it to this fascinating piece of this waterfall here. If you were to keep going, the cave would go on for another 20 miles. 20 miles. The waterfall marks one and a half hours in. From there, we turn back. Three hours of treading water, and it's not enough to absorb all that Honey Creek Cave has to offer. Sarah, what'd you think? Amazing. And the water was so cool. It was beautiful to actually be in the aquifer. The adventure also underscores just how important caves like this one are to Comal County. What would happen if you put development on top of a cave like this? Well, you know, one of the concerns, especially without good environmental controls, is that we would see runoff from the urbanization, you know, oil, grease, uh, heavy metals, etc. And therein lies the current debate. How to balance a want to live in the Hill Country with protecting why people are coming here in the first place. All of Comal County is super significant because it's either over the Trinity Aquifer or the Edwards Aquifer. So almost the entire county is recharge zone for our water supply. Recently, the land known as Honey Creek Spring Ranch, which is home to the part of Honey Creek Cave we were fortunate enough to swim into and where Honey Creek Spring is located, was placed into a conservation easement, 700 acres worth. A huge step forward for those looking to protect this ecosystem. This kind of easement means the landowners retain ownership, but it can't be subdivided and limits structures. In other words, it's protected in perpetuity. When the landowner decided that, that, that they needed to do this, there was a, a, a lot of uh, excitement in our organization because we recognized how important this piece of property was. If they had decided to do the other thing, to, to sell it, um, the, the only people that could have afforded it would have been developers and we might have houses right up on top of that spring which would have diminished 
uh, everything about it. It was a collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and the landowners. Owned by the Moors and the Gosses, this land has been in their family for six generations. Some of the most incredible owners of any cave in this country. While we weren't able to talk to the landowners, we're told they likely took less money than if they chose to sell to a developer. And at the end of the day, they received peace of mind. The conservation easement is, is really special. It will hopefully uh, protect a large part of the cave. Uh, of course, some of our concerns is, is that the cave is so extensive that the conservation easement doesn't cover the entire cave. And so, um, you know, there needs to be efforts made to try and protect the entire watershed for the cave. Which means despite sitting adjacent to Honey Creek State Natural Area, which contains more of Honey Creek, conservation of this part of Comal County may not be done. There's a nearby one, Honey Creek Ranch, that is still um, status unknown. Very close to being closed on a conservation easement, but a hang up over a water contract. You're not gonna stop development, but uh, hopefully with uh, protecting the right places, you can not kill the golden goose. There could hardly be anything more important to the humans living in this area than to protect our water supply. And by protecting the land over the aquifer, you're protecting the water. And while you're doing that, you're also protecting wildlife. Rapid growth may have taken Kamau County a bit by surprise with conservation efforts now getting up to speed. But you can bet that development and conservation will be a point of contention in the county for years to come. And regardless of where you stand, one thing is for sure. The natural resources in Comal County are nothing short of stunning and Honey Creek Cave still has more beauty to reveal. I've enjoyed being able to explore it all these years and I hope that, that future generations of cavers can also en enjoy it uh, and continue to add to its survey. For Case That Explains, I'm meteorologist Justin Horn. You can watch any Case That Explains story by scanning the QR code you see right here. That will take you to the Explains webpage where you can view all our episodes on a variety of topics all on demand. Look for a brand new Case That Explains next Monday right here on the News at 6. We'll be right back. News around America now caught on camera over the weekend. A whale breached and landed on the bow of a small boat. First responders in Plymouth, Massachusetts say no one was hurt here and there was no major damage to the 19 foot boat. Now the Massachusetts Environmental Police will investigate this. The Plymouth Harbor Master Department says that boaters should try to stay at least 300 feet from whales to minimize potential interactions, but Wild animals are just that and don't really abide by those rules. The Florida Highway Patrol releasing video of a strange encounter outside of Orlando. You see what that is? That's a woman standing in the rain outside of a grocery store with a pitchfork and a whip. Apparently she was at the store trying to sell teddy bears. She's accused of damaging a car with that pitchfork. Officers say she referred to herself in the third person. And when the arresting officer asked if she was on anything, she said yes. She's facing an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge. I also noticed the rain in that video. Ugh, I know. For just a few drops. I, my husband and I watched a movie or a show this weekend uh -huh. that had rain in just the background, and we both commented on it. Oh had nothing God. to do with the plot. We just noticed the rain. We, How desperate we are. Patty Santos did a story on the anniversary of the what of the flooding in New Braunfels. Oh, obviously oh, yeah. we don't need we don't need that much, but just yes. Oh yeah, it did used to rain here. It, yes, and it, it is a thing where we usually go periods of without rain, and then all of a sudden we get too much of a good thing. But we're not going to get anything of a good thing over the next few days. It's going to stay fairly dry. The high temperature was 101 today. Elsewhere it was 102 in Honda, 103 in Pleasanton, 102 in Del Rio. Coming up, we're going to take a check on area lakes and reservoirs. And I'll have a look at what potentially August could bring us in just a few minutes. All right, so how close are we to the all time record? And is there any sign that we're not going to get the all time record for 100 degree days? Well, we are close to that. So the all time record is 59 back in 2009. We're at 46 right now. So that's yeah. pretty close. And by the way, all signs point to this July being our hottest on record. And that goes back to 1885. And this follows 
a all time record hot May, June and now July. So it's been pretty brutal and the area lakes and reservoirs are showing that. Take a look at some of these levels, uh, especially, especially Medina Lake. If you live out there, you know, you know how low that lake is down to 11%, the lowest it's been since 2015. Right after we got those floods in 2015, Medina Lake filled back up but it's been a while since it's been this low. Amistad Reservoir, only 34% full, down 14 feet in the last year. And by the way, Amistad Reservoir now at its lowest levels since its inundation back in the 70s. Uh, Choke Canyon down to 35%. Up in Austin, Lake Travis down to 54%. Canyon Lake not as impacted by droughts as other area lakes, still at 90% full. So if you're looking to enjoy some time on the lakes, that canyon lake is still 90% full, uh, down two feet in the last year. Now, unfortunately, August is looking like it is going to be status quo for us. The Climate Prediction Center has put out this uh, look for August. All signs point to above average temperatures. Average high in August is typically right around 97. So we'll probably be above that for quite a, a bit in August. And unfortunately, this is the real kicker. Below average precipitation uh, is more than likely uh, from the Climate Prediction Center. The one thing that we keep on talking about that would help us in this drought situation would be some type of development in the Atlantic Ocean tropical system, but it's just not in the cards. The heat high is firmly in place. Monsoonal rains though for the Four Corners region and then up across uh, the Northeast and into New England, there's some severe weather this evening. But as I said, in the tropi tropics in the Atlantic, there is no development that's expected over the next five days. So our only chance for rain over the next several days is a coastal shower or storm perhaps making it to that I-35 corridor. That's why there's a 10% chance for uh, rain Wednesday through Friday. It's almost comical at this point if it wasn't so bad for our local farmers. And of course, uh, the aquifer is falling as well. A lot of brown yards out there. Temperatures in still near 100 degrees. It's 101 in New Braunfels, 101 in Hondo, 101 in Del Rio. It's 99 here in San Antonio and a local view around the metro area. Uh, Converse, you're at 100 degrees this evening. Now we are seeing these winds pick up. Winds have been picking up in the evening hours recently. We've got wind gusts of up to 25 miles per hour from the southeast around the metro area. It's going to be a windy evening with gusts up to about 30 miles per hour through about midnight and those winds will die down in the overnight hours, but generally it's going to be a warm evening if you've got Monday night plans. Temperatures falling into the 80s. Here's your KSAT 12 hour forecast to plan your day tomorrow. Uh, whatever you've been doing the last few days, do it tomorrow too because <laughs> the weather is going to be practically the same. Waking up at 80 degrees early tomorrow for that commute and then as we head into the afternoon hours, 90s winds will pick up from the south at about 10 to 15. 101 for the high temperature tomorrow. Elsewhere, not too much variation for the high temperatures. You know, even in the hill country, temperatures will be slightly below 100, but generally across the case at 12 viewing area, highs near 100 to 102. Looking at that forecast over the next seven days look familiar. It's not weather deja vu. You're just seeing the same weather over and over again over the next few days. Highs will be near 100 degrees. There may be a chance that Wednesday and Monday we may briefly dip below 100, but still it's going to feel like it anyway out there. We're in the doldrums. The doldrums, mm -hmm. the dog days. That's so. for sure. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. In case you missed it, coming up next. It is Monday, July 25th. More than a thousand inter CPS Energy customers are now without power. I've just been uh, talking to the incident commander here with San Antonio Fire Department. They tell me they believe that the fire started with this power pole when that fire sparked, then uh, spread into a straight line right behind me into this greenway, into the field that you see behind me. About 20 acres that were impacted. CPS Energy crews have been working and they tell us they should have the power back on around 
630. This morning, it's been two months since the tragedy in Uvalde at Robb Elementary School. Across downtown Uvalde, murals are being painted to honor the 21 victims killed in that shooting. It is part of a project called Healing Uvalde 21 Portrait Murals. Artists from across Texas have been paired with a victim based around a connection they share. The murals will be finished in the next couple of weeks and a dedication ceremony is in the works for August. The brutal heat that's bearing down on the United States shows no sign of letting up. More than 60 million people right now are under a heat alert today. That includes much of the Northeast, Central Plains and Pacific Northwest. For folks in the Northeast, things are expected to cool off tomorrow thanks to a cold front and some storms. Lucky them. I want to show you this picture or this video. This is from Arthur out of New Braunfels. This is one of those nest cameras. You can see last night that fireball that came across the sky. We've got so many perspectives of it. Uh, thanks to folks sending in video and pictures to our KSAC Connect. This is one of those, but a great angle there. Uh, we've got a nice write up on it on KSAC.com if you want to check it out. Another in case you missed it, today was 46 100 degree days so far this year. We are firmly in that third place position, 2022 of 46 100 degree days. We're closing in on the silver. We just need 11 more days of 100 degree weather, which is entirely possible, and 13 to get up to that first place position back in 2009 when we had 59 100 degree days. We'll add another one on definitely tomorrow. 78 early in the morning, 91 at noon around lunch, and 101 for the high temperature. Sunsets tomorrow at 8.30. Looking at that forecast over the next uh, several days, triple digit tally going to be going up, and our rain chances are not great. Only a 10% chance for a sea breeze shower Wednesday through Friday. I do not want to go for the gold. Let's not try. You know what? I, my thing is like we might as well. Might as well. We're going to get the hot days anyway. Might as well just <laughs> I, do it. Ugh, ugh.